Welcome to the IoT podcast. We really appreciate all of our followers. Thank you so much for joining us on our journey and witnessing some of the fantastic guests that we've had on the show. We've actually had some really great suggestions for the format and how we take things further. One of which has been an amazing idea to have a guest takeover series. What we've decided to do is actually have two industry leaders themselves interview each other on our platform. And I'm delighted to welcome you to that episode now. Hey everyone, uh, thanks for coming today. Uh, welcome to the IoT podcast guest host takeover. I'm your host, Paul Bullock. Uh, my background is in M2M and IoT and all levels of the network stack in product and business development. Most recently, I helped start a business at Jersey Telecom, their IoT connectivity business, and I was director of business development in the IoT group at Arm. And I work for a really cool company right now called EdgeX, EDJX.io, where we've developed our own edge OS and edge network for advancing the cause of edge compute in IoT and other places. I'm joined today with uh, our guest, Augustin Pelez. Augustin is the CEO and co-founder of UbiDots. It's a business operating a data-driven IoT application platform to innovate IoT application development. Augustin started engineering a monitoring solution for Airbus Germany, but with his co-founder Gustavo, fathered the UbiDots platform to reduce waste and empower economization of production resources. So Augustin, welcome. Thank you very much for making time today. Um, Thank you, Paul. Tell us a bit about your background in IoT and how and why you started the business. Of course. Um, well, very glad to be here and very looking forward to to learn uh, from your experience, which I think it's, it's very rich, in, uh, both in terms of business and IoT. So looking forward to, to have a, a, a nice chat. Uh, well, I got into IoT because of my co-founders who, uh, well, we've been together. If I zoom up, uh, all the projects we've done is gonna uh, is going to account for about 10 years. Um, I'm very, uh, at the beginning, we began doing projects for the healthcare industry. So I'm originally from Medellin, Colombia, and uh, there were a lot of hospitals in our region that didn't have or had like, like legacy systems to monitor temperature and humidity in the vaccines uh, refrigerators. Uh, so we began creating IoT solutions for them. Uh, and in the process, we, we thought, well, it would be very cool if there was like a, a place where we could just send all of this data without having to deal with uh, software engineering teams and uh, requirements, specifications, visualizations. Um, and back then we, we couldn't find anything. We're talking uh, maybe yeah, like seven to, to eight years back. Um, so that's how the idea of Ubidots was born uh, and how, how you like to call it in, in entrepreneurship, uh, the, the motivation to scratch your own itch, kind of solve a problem that you had first and that will give you a lot of tools to understand what's needed out there. And that's exactly what we did. We built the Widots as an me easy means for any IoT entrepreneurs like ourselves back in the days to create entire IoT projects without having to hire a software engineering team. Cool. We um, really need that. Um, we keep, you know, IoT is not a very mature industry. It gets lots and lots of press everywhere, but there's all kinds of little companies like yours and the one I work with trying to put things together. And buyers, whether they're consumers or enterprise like Bosch, they always face this challenge of uh, build versus buy. I think it's fair to say that most uh, manufacturing processes and procurement people and IT people see the potential of IoT, but they keep figuring out how best to do it. Um, you know, do you have a perspective on, um, on on build versus buy in the context of UbiDots? Maybe you could point to an example where you, you've you've built something that gets reused by more than one customer and thereby you know creates inherent efficiencies. 
Absolutely. And I think the build versus buy discussion um, is very common among us engineers. Uh, a lot of the, the buyers on the other side are uh, trying to build things themselves because, well, we, we tend to do that as engineers. We, we like to you know, download the, the latest Grafana version and install it in our own servers and, and use that to create a quick prototype to, to visualize sensor data. Uh, I personally do that myself and I love it. Uh, <laughs> it's fun. Uh, but when, when it comes to, to a, a real like on production application, uh, there's a lot of hidden costs in the process. So one, of course, is the time that it takes to build the entire uh, stack, even if you use existing tools. Uh, and the second is when things go wrong. So you can have like this mashup of, for example, uh, Grafana with a node red, uh, with maybe a layer of storage and some alerts using Twilio uh, and it might work well for a year, but then sometime at, at 3 a.m. in the morning, uh, it's going to break for whatever reason and then uh, you're not going to be there to, to fix it and, and this hour or extra two to three hours that it failed might ha represent a huge loss in, in a per production application. So uh, I think uh, it, it's great to, to tinker with, with a lot of the tools out there. And from our perspective, what it means is uh, UbiDots put together a lot of backend and frontend ingredients that are common to both IoT applications. So from uh, time series storage to alerts to connected, connecting with other systems through webhooks and APIs. Uh, of course, visualizations, create your own widget or use one of our 20 existing widgets, uh, create uh, serverless functions to compute like uh, very rapidly uh, a specific uh, transformation about the data, etc. So we we are a, a tool at the end. You know, we're also one of those tools, but we we packed the most common ingredients uh, at the application layer. So yeah, we would be the in the build versus buy description. We would definitely be the buy one, where you you can just buy you know, one license per month, that's going to solve you a lot of headaches. It's funny, everything really, you said there echoes um, a lot of what we do at EdgeX, but from a slightly different angle. Like we see, and we saw this at ARM a lot. Um, I talked to so many cool, smart guys, but everybody's trying to reinvent the same wheel over and over again. So at EdgeX, what, what we've done to tackle this is develop our own OS, but Arguably more importantly, our own edge network protocols, which are comprised of uh, you know, distributed ledger content addressing and fundamentally a peer-to-peer -peer network, which means any compute power, doesn't have to be ours, that joins our network automatically becomes part of the edge cloud, so to speak. And when you publish an application like yours onto the edge net, it becomes simultaneously available at every node. So you awesome. can see, and so there's this inherent multi-tenancy to it, which means, you know, in the same way that AWS is multi-tenant, but you got to pay Amazon arms and legs to to use their stuff. We're offering a, a multi-tenant platform that just that costs a finger as opposed to an arm and a leg, <laughs> and, and, and 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 most importantly, brings the compute power right as close to the data, whether that's a thing or a person, as it wants to be. Our, our stuff really does echo each other. Um, yeah. I mean, I have sort of a related follow-up question for you. If, if you can think of an example where, um, you know, you, you've seen customers where you've come into a project after something's gone wrong, or maybe you bid on a project, lost it, and then saw it go wrong to the, afterwards. <laughs> can you can you think of an example like that? Yeah, you mean in the within the build versus buy. In that, frame, in, in that frame, yeah. Yeah, so we, we've seen instances where they come to us after they fail. So uh, 20 to 30 people company, they already tried to build something on their own. They had some developers in-house, other developers hired uh, through a freelancing platform, for example. Um, and after a few years, well, maybe maybe after a year or maximum two years, 
they said, okay, we've, we've used all of these resources, uh, but more than the resources, we are not uh, in the market yet. So we wanted to have this ag tech solution because we had these many opportunities, and now we've lost a few of them because of the time to market. So now they come to us and they realize they can build a lot of, maybe 80% of the things real quick. There might be a remaining 20% that's a sacrifice because you, you are using a product instead of building your own solution. Uh, but this 80 to 90% already takes them to market. And I think that's very important. I've seen it again from, you know, failed project to going into the product. And I've also seen it the, the other way. Like uh, there was a hospital in, in the Philippines that had been a customer for, for a lot of years. Um, and I realized they, they began like uh, offloading a lot of devices, like, okay, like something's going on here. Maybe they don't like your product. Maybe, you know, they're, they're shutting off the project. And we reached out and it, and it turns out they, they decided to, to build a, a platform on their own. They had like a very specific requirements including uh, deployment within the Philippines for health regulation issues. Um, and they said, well, you know, we, we know we can get away with $200 per month that we pay you, but, you know, we, we, we know this is going to cost us a few thousands and a few months or years, uh, but we want to do it because it's a, yeah, it's a specific regulation. So I think I've seen both cases and I think both are, are equally valid. I've seen a couple examples in industrial IoT where people are trying to do, you know, industry 4.0 and all that. And invariably, it means you have to drop boxes into, say, manufacturing floors. And those boxes are probably IoT gateways of some type, and they run Windows or something. And so these projects invariably run into the challenge of trying to coordinate so many different pieces of a given enterprise, whether it's their product people, their software people, their hardware people, their IT people, et cetera. And that really loads a lot of cost and pain and time into the deployment and it ends up being a frustrating thing. When what, what we're doing is, as opposed to, again, I'll use the AWS example, as opposed to hiring, so you want to accomplish something, you can hire some devs to write an app on AWS and deliver a business requirement. You don't really have to involve your IT department so much. And we're trying to, we're, we're, we're replicating that to a pretty meaningful degree in that getting some, very vanilla compute in place, installing Edge OS, writing, getting some, get, writing your app yourself on Edge OS or getting somebody to do it, and then distribute the vanilla compute wherever it needs to be, and the app just appears there. It's a much, and you can have your backhaul via cellular or you know, plug it in with Ethernet, whatever mm -hmm. you want. It's a way to reduce a lot of the friction that you get in trying to change enterprise direction and deploying new things. Oh, I see it. And, and, you know, maybe if we had known about you guys when this Philippine hospital churned, we would have been able to retain them by using your distributed cloud. The very next, the very next one you come across, all right? <laughs> yeah, sounds good. Um, so uh, UbiDocs is, is, a, is a pure cloud software play. Um, you know, actually, what you just said is kind of half answering the question about that. Um, you know, I've actually written down here, there might have been instances where Edge Computer could have enabled even more projects. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, yeah, I was getting that. into that. I see. Um, yeah, there's a lot of instances. I, I can think of a few. Mm, I think, well, well, what you just said about industrial IoT is, is one. I think there's the, the ecosystem uh, the out, like control automation, like this type of system integration, uh, and and the the end user is very used to buying uh, things up front. Maybe not very friend, friends with recurrency yet, uh, and in the same lines, along the same lines, they like to host uh, a lot of things themselves. So, a great pitch could have been maybe, uh, yes, I mean we have with the UbiDots cloud as a way to. Uh, see the last mile of the data, but you can keep it within uh, like a closer at the edge uh, for your own analytics, for example. Uh, and, and specific to that could be, you know, they measure a lot of the, the productivity, the OEE, 
for instance, the, the, which is a combination between um, like equipment downtime, like availability, uh, productivity, and quality. So they, they like to measure, like every factory in the world does it. Uh, it they just measure it either very manually or more digitally. Uh, so we, we, we see a lot of use cases where they measure productivity and availability, no questions asked. It can go to the cloud, whether a machine is turned on or, or off, how many units you produced. But when you need to bake in the, the quality aspect, that's more tricky. Like you need, sometimes you need uh, image processing. Imagine like a production line that's uh, checking whether each unit looks exactly the same as, the, as a reference unit uh, at a speed that could just not be sent up to the cloud to do like an image processing and then turn, come back and say, hey, yeah, this unit is okay. Maybe those five to 10 seconds or even less could uh, it would won't just work for the production. So I think that that um, image processing use case could be a very cool one where you can install um, some processing capacity at the edge that responds faster uh, for for this whether a unit is has a, enough quality or not. Um, and then lat latency in general, like we we have our main infrastructure is. Uh, in, in Toronto, IBM Toronto, your home city, I guess. <laughs> um, and But when a customer is in Australia, for example, then the latency is becomes more apparent, you know, like maybe yeah. it's uh, 500 milliseconds more than it should. So in those cases, you know, having like a satellite ingestion tier where you can reply, like the API can respond faster to devices maybe 300 milliseconds as opposed to a second or even less, uh, it, it made it would have made sense in, in a lot of in, in some use cases in Australia. Yeah, as you're saying, so you know, I think that, that context generally might be, you know, video as a sensor where you, you want you want to capture images and make decisions in real time without bearing the cost of backhauling it to some computer somewhere a zillion miles away. Yeah, and, and now uh, another one came to mind now that you said, um, Predictive analytics, so very tied to vibration in a lot of machines. Uh, we work with uh, NCD.io, like a very cool uh, gateway and hardware manufacturer uh, in the industrial space. So they already, uh, and a lot of other players, they already offer like vibration sensors. The problem is that it's a very high frequency. So most of our use cases are like uh, on a per minute basis, you know, update the variable. That's a great use case for Edge because the, the frequency, the sampling frequency, yeah. it, it, it is um, uh, negated by latency. Exactly. Yeah. And, and if you are doing like a fast Fourier transformation to know whether a machine is vibrating at 80 hertz as opposed to 75, which it yeah. should, uh, maybe it's because it has a problem in its maintenance. Uh, but right now we, we don't have those type of use cases that actually send like the entire acceleration time series because it's a very high sampling rate. So if there was something in the middle where you say, okay, this um, yeah, millisecond spaced acceleration data is 75 Hertz. And then you send the, that only that data to the cloud as opposed to sending a thousand samples per second. So yeah. that's, that's a very cool one as well. That's a good one. We should, we should speak about that offline, actually. Um, we wanted to, I wanted to hear your thoughts and, and I'll share mine on, you know, what's the coolest thing happening this year for you in our industries? I, I'm very excited about cellular IoT, but uh, I think you're more okay. of an expert in that regard. No. <laughs> so it would be actually more interesting to, to listen to, to your inputs as well. I have some initial thoughts, but uh, I don't know. Would you agree that that's kind of a, a big thing these years? I think it's pretty huge. I think um, I think there's an intersection happening between edge compute and cellular in a couple of different ways. Around the things that we've been talking about, getting compute closer to the people or things, compute always wants to be closest, as close as it can get to the raw data. But there's a thing called neutral host happening and neutral host is a uh, standard that allows anybody to put you've probably heard of a thing called private LTE 
Or I, I, can, I can put up my own private LTE network in my house if I want, and I'm on my own network. They also have a concept called neutral host that takes a little subcomponent of a big mobile network called an eNode B and a little radio. Okay. And I can, I can send up a signal that's a 4G, 5G signal, and users can actually, an AT&T user can roam onto my little network. That's, okay. that's, that's kind of cool at one basic level where the operators can extend their signal uh, very inexpensively into places of congestion, you know, uh, new builds, whatever it is. But imagine if you throw a bit of compute on there. So I've got this node that's a, maybe like a 22 use rack, half, mm -hmm. a half rack server with, a, with an E node B and a radio mask on top of it that's putting out a 4G signal. All the users and things can log on to that. I can host applications locally where the users of those applications are mobile centric. But the killer is actually, a, one of the killers here is content delivery. Because you know, 50% of the world's internet is delivered over things like Akamai and Fastly and Cloudflare. Okay. But content delivery systems for mobile don't exist. And the way data is moved around mobile networks is a nightmare. There's a massive trombone between your, your phone and the center of the mobile network. And moving content delivery closer to the mobile data consumer is a net new application of both neutral host, like I described, where I'm pushing the network edge out, the radio mm -hmm. network edge, and I'm also pushing the compute edge out. So you can imagine in, say, like a, a Walmart or a Asda or a you know, a big a big company building. When I can extend AT&T's network in there and bring a bunch of application services and bring a bunch of content all in one 22U server, I'm, wow. solving, I'm solving a lot of problems and creating several new revenue streams around that edge node. So I'm kind of, I think that's pretty, I think there's something in there. That's very cool. Like from the IoT perspective, like I always, uh, thought about the typical, you know, energy consumption range, uh, price per month, but I never thought about what happens in the backstage or at the edge of, of a cellular network. And, and what you just mentioned just opens up uh, like a lot of faster applications mm -hmm. and even more these startup opportunities, I, I guess. Like it's going to be exciting to see what happens in the next years. Yeah, we're not the only ones thinking about this, but. Um... You know, once you get your head around being able to put your own spectrum canopy up, charge the MNOs, the mobile operators for access to it to improve their levels of service to their customers, mm -hmm. put applications and content into the edge node that allows the location of that node, whether it's retail, corporate, industrial, to make use of edge compute. I think I, think I counted five different revenue streams that can be built around one edge node. Plus, yeah. plus making making stuff work better in general. Yeah, and, and out of those five revenue streams you just mentioned, um, maybe one or two are uh, like directly IoT related. So there's even more. Like I always approach this cellular IoT, you know, from from the IoT perspective. But there's even more to it. Uh, I see to to end users, consumers. It's, a, so it's, it's very like, cool. Yeah, it's a bit grand, but it is. You know, it's a bit of you know. We call it the edge economy, which I think is a bit grand, but you mm -hmm. know, it's kind of there is an edge economy to to what's going to happen in the same way there has been a web economy. Very cool, and and what, one more reason to to track the progress of of cellular IoT. Um, what what fascinates me is, uh, of course, the tech behind and everything. It's it's and the, the enablement for a lot of IoT applications that. We potentially see with a, within our user base, uh, you know, a lot of them would like to to take the track into the next level. They already track cars and equipment, but maybe they want to track uh, cheaper equipment or smaller equipment. Um, I think it's fascinating because from the economic point of view, like what what's going to happen? Like what are those decision makers going to? Finally, decide. Like uh, I've seen, uh, in one side of the spectrum, you know, you see a big push in cellular IoT, which makes sense. Uh, but in the other side, you also see 
like entity Docomos from Japan, they sh they actually shut down the the NBIOT network last year, which is yeah. was strange to me. So I'm yeah. thinking like, okay, what's going to happen? And what I see in Colombia and maybe in other countries in Latin America is like the, the operators are a bit uh, shy to make the final decision to deploy because what they say is, okay, we have all of these customers that already pay us for, I don't know, fleet tracking and all of these applications, they're paying us maybe uh, $3 per month to save so, uh, any value. Um, and now you're telling me we need to upgrade our network, do this millions of dollars investment to be able to charge less per device. So what's <laughs> What's my incentive? And of course, yeah. the incentive is the scale, but there's like a delay between the investment and the decision and the actual payback, the actual payback, which, you know, if we learn from Sigfox and other, other players, this uh, payback might be longer than, than we all expected. What do you think? I, I think you're right, and I think it's a chicken and egg, it's a chicken and egg argument. And the CFO at your typical mobile operator does not want to be the chicken waiting for the egg to hatch. <laughs> okay, that's a good way to say. <laughs> so yeah, you have a disconnect there, and that's another dynamic that excites me about that convergence of cellular IoT and edge, is that this neutral host model can solve this to not every degree, but to a to a substantial degree for these operators. Um, like the operators hate 5G because it's an opportunity for them to double their radio access net network costs with no clear with no clear chance of any new no money. <laughs> so, so it's so, your job to show them new revenue streams, I guess. Yeah, yeah and, and, and ways to reduce their capex by attaching revenue to smaller radio nodes that they can participate in too. But then other participants in the, you know, within the range of that signal, there's many other participants, either providers of services and content or consumers thereof. Very cool. Oh, I look forward to, to, to tracking. We should do this again, like in, in one year to see. Yeah. To see, well, to visit I our notes. EdgeX has a couple of cool PR announcements coming up. So, so do, um, do follow our newsletter if you can. Do you want to talk? You guys got any particularly cool projects you want to talk about? Or do you want to make the audience aware of? Things they yeah, should be well, talking to you about. Uh, I think um, uh, a lot of the learnings in IoT is the what you just mentioned about. Well, we talked about not building everything from scratch, and that relates a lot to integrating. At the end, if uh, the buyer is is finally being aware that they don't want to build everything themselves, at least they want to see a degree of compatibility between all the layers of the stack. So we, we are working on that very actively. We, we just launched a new model called Ubidots Plugins, which exactly pursues um, like the, the best simplicity in the industry in terms of uh, connect uh, weather data sources, satellite data, uh, Loro One network servers, uh, potentially tomorrow, you know, if, if cellular IoT uh, ends up having like a middleware that we can also connect to, and we will do it. So it's called Ubidots plugins, and uh, we're adding, yeah, we have uh, AWS IoT as a data source. We have Open Weather, which allows you to uh, drop a pin anywhere in the world and get the data. Uh, we're working on an air quality one because this time of the year, particularly in my city, it, there's like a lot of fog and people are very uh, concerned about that. So we want to deploy it soon. Um, Helium, the things, industries. Yeah, we, we're working on a lot of plugins, and I think that's going to be like a, a major leap for a lot of our customers to be able to enrich their IoT application with data sources that they didn't know they could tap into. That sounds cool, man. I like all the environmental monitoring stuff. Um, well, I guess I want to say thank you to the audience and um, thank you to the people at the IoT podcast who allowed this takeover to happen. And thank you to Agustin from MovieDots and thank you to my employer, EdgeX, for allowing me to do this. Okay, I <laughs> hope everybody has a good day. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye.